I'd like to welcome you to the Dan John Podcast, where your questions are answered and your answers are questioned. I'm here every week bringing the best and brightest of our field and me. Episode three. Well, welcome back, people. One of the things I'd like to do is remind everybody to go to On Target Publications and be sure to sign up for my weekly free newsletter, Wandering Weights. In there, I include every week uh, podcast details. I also include uh, where I'm going to be in the world in the next few months. I also usually have a little article in there that's usually just for uh, members of Wandering Weights and Dan John Workouts. And then I go around the web and I pull off certain articles uh, that I like and I make a little comment on them and I cut and paste just a little bit that you might like to, to read. Uh, this week coming up, uh, there's only two articles and they're really interesting on one of them is how vegetables are trying to kill you, which is why they're good for you, which I found just fascinating. And then after that, every week, I'm doing a paragraph by paragraph study of the sword and the stone. So sometimes when you ask questions uh, to hear on the podcast, they might already be answered in the wandering weights. For example, let's start answering questions uh, from our, our, our listeners and readers. The first one's from Cameron. Hi, Dan. Can you advise when you'll be next in the UK or Ireland for workshops? Well, there you go, Cameron. Um, I'll be in Belfast uh, uh, for two workshops in uh, the end of October. And then uh, right after that, I'll probably do one or two down in Galway. I don't have those out. I only have one of those for sure. So, but you'll find that information and how to sign up for it on the upcoming Wandering Weights, okay? It's with my friend Emma, who took an RKC with me a few months ago. Love to have you guys come down. Always room for more. And it's just not that uh, big of a journey, okay? You know, the next question, though, is something that, uh, you know, it, it's a question that comes up a lot. It's from Todd. Hi, Todd. Sorry, that's a Saturday Night Fever. Uh, check that, Saturday Night Life. How important or unimportant is it to stick to an exact schedule of a particular program? Well, I mean, this is just the basics for me, Todd. If it's a bus bench program, in other words, like the Soviet squat program or my little thing called Mass Made Simple or the Big 21 program, you absolutely have to stick to it, 100%. Otherwise, you're just, you're just wasting your time and the author's time or the coach's time to put the program together. If, however, you are just going to the gym three to five days a week, getting the work in, and life happens, which it does a lot, then, then you, of course, uh, do what Buddha's famous last words were, do your best. And I think do your best is an underappreciated concept. Um, yesterday at the gym, I, did, uh, I was supposed to do goblet squats with 28 kilos. And I, I got in there and I thought to myself, 28 kilos. I mean, I just had a total hip replacement in December. And then I started to talk myself down. Well, once I started picking up the weights, I ended up doing the beast, which is 48 kilos. So I did the workout as planned and did more. And I think there's a lesson of life in there some there, Todd, that sometimes if you grant yourself a little bit of permission to to take your foot off the gas, you find that things can actually end up going pretty well. So I did not say it depends. What I said was this, if you're on a structured program, you got to stick to the structure. Um, I've been told some of my coaching friends that there's a gym that if you don't finish a workout, you're kicked out of the gym. That would be one extreme. I would say, I wouldn't, I hate to say Marty Gallagher would be in that extreme, but Marty's a big believer that if you're in a 12 week cycle and you miss uh, the reps you're supposed to do, the whole cycle was wrong. The whole 12 week period was wrong. That's, you're supposed to get, you know, back squat, you know, 505 for eight reps and you only get seven. The whole 12 weeks was wrong. Isn't that fascinating? Now, on the other hand, if you're, if you're going to the gym a lot to feel better, look better, move better, and there's something comes up in life, or that's just the day you feel sore. Like today, I was sore in my shoulders. Uh, maybe you need a little bit more warm up, or you just need to get going and show up and get the job done. I hope that's enough of an answer. That's always a tough one. 
So the answer is yes, stick to the program. And the answer is no, <laughs> play around a little bit. And both of those answers are true. Now, if we had an organized program and you followed it to a T and you still failed at your goal, well, then, then that's an interesting discussion we can have. If you didn't follow the program and you failed, th th it's a much easier answer. You didn't do the program. And what we, I hope you just heard what I was trying to do. It's a logic thing. Most people, when they do programs, still don't get their job, the job done. Most people don't follow programs and don't get the job done. In other words, most of the time, people don't get the job done. So part of my job as your friend and your coach is to find those ways that we can get you to get the goal you want, or at least close enough that you feel, you know, you feel like it was worth, it was worth all the work. Most people come up short on their goals and that's okay. The second little point I'm trying to make Todd is this, let's stop looking at the programs and let's start looking at everything else too. Maybe that's a discussion to follow up on in the future, I think. Okay. Okay, Doug. Oh, Doug, Doug, Doug. Doug, you ask a question that I'm never comfortable with, but let's go ahead and ask the question. Yesterday, an MRI confirmed a torn meniscus and arthritis in my right knee. I can move around, ride a bike, mow grass, etc., with a little pain discomfort. Any suggestions on leg exercises to do or stay away from on my park bench workouts? Also, are there any supplements that you that helped you when you had arthritis in your hip? Meniscus surgery should happen this spring. Doug, that's medical advice. And I'm not comfortable giving medical advice. But I am comfortable with giving you general advice. And the general advice is this, and it's happened with every surgery I've ever had. When my left wrist was broken, I worked my legs and my right side as hard as I physically could because the body is one piece. So when all those wonderful hormones and all those other things are swimming through your various systems, from your blood system, from your lymphatic system, all that good stuff is swimming through, including the injured area. So if you can, as best you can, if you can work your upper body, your whichever leg is your good leg as much as you can, any way you can figure it out, and just be as coddling and gentle to the injured side as you can. I don't think there's anybody in the world who would consider that bad advice. Uh, when you ask about arthritis, <laughs> my arthritis is in a hazmat bin somewhere. Uh, they drilled it out. Um, I, I do get advice from my coach, Dick Notmeyer. He's 87. In fact, his birthday is coming up in just a, a few weeks, uh, October 12th. Um, and he's a big believer in glucosamine for his arthritis problems. But even then, you know, um, you know, it's, it's the old joke about you close the barn door after the horses have bolted or after the horses run away is glucosamine closing the door after it's already too late. I don't know. Um, I know some people, you know, use, uh, uh, use doses of aspirin to help them with this. But again, we're, we're sneaking into medical advice area. What I'd like you to do for me, Doug, if you don't mind, I would like you to, uh, sit down with either your doctor, your therapist, or somebody who, who you can trust, who will be around before, during, and after the surgery, and plot out the path on this. Since you're getting surgery in the spring, um, you have plenty of time to do some, some smart stuff. I'll tell you one thing, if you can, if you can lose some body fat, uh, I, I don't, Doug, I, I mean, you might weigh, I mean, you might be 3% body fat, so I have to be careful here. But generally, to help, especially lower body injuries, uh, feet, ankle, knee, hip, eh, even thigh injuries, losing body mass sometimes will do wonders for it. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Doug, a follow-up for me, um, consult your, your, your health professionals, find out what, get a ballpark on what they think, let me know about your body mass, and then let, let's revisit this question if you're okay with that. Well, now we have a question from our good friend, Ben Ben, who's uh, not unlike Dan John, where parents had multiple names. Uh, regarding the hero's journey, it's funny you even mentioned that. I've got, I just bought Campbell's book again, and it's 
upstairs in my office. Is it possible for the hero to have multiple calls for action? The answer is yes, but we'll get into the whole question. How can one figure which is his true call for action? Well, that's another thing. Uh, think about Beowulf, for example, our good friend Beowulf. Uh, Beowulf shows up because there's this beast, you know, an, a misunderstood uh, descendant of Cain who lives in a moor or a bog named Grendel. And, of course, our the hero, uh, Beowulf, takes Grendel down, rips his right arm, pins it to the ceiling, and kills the beast, uh, kills the, the, the bog monster. Of course, Grendel has a mom. Grendel's mother shows up very angry. And, of course, our, our hero then has to swim down, pass all the water wolves and everything, and take and chop off Grendel's mother's head. Okay. Fifty years later, the dragon shows up. Those are all calls for action. Um, at the last, the last time I was ever with Coach Mon, um, I thought the presenter giving him the award was kind of full of crap. I, I to be honest with you, but the the presenter said something. He said he mentioned Beowulf, and that the dragon had grown a foot a year. And he equated that with how we age, because Coach Mon was just destroyed by Parkinson's disease. He was just so broken. Uh, it was just so, you know, this is 13 years ago, and I'm, I'm getting emotional about it. But um, Ben, Ben, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is nobody ever has a single call to action. I don't know where you are in life, but. Well, I'll give you an example. I got called to action this weekend. We threw this big party Saturday night, and it was huge. And the cleanup took Saturday night, probably cleaned up for three hours, and then I probably cleaned up for another four or five in the morning. Our daughter dropped the grandkids by because she was going to go to a birthday brunch, uh, not not really a good thing to have a five- and six-year-old at. And the, the wait staff was terrible. They were slow. And while my daughter was at brunch, our grandchildren both got sick and began having vomiting contests. So they were just, I was sitting on the couch, nice as can be. Josephine came over crying. I said, you okay? And she vomited all over me, which hasn't happened to me since her mother did it to me uh, 20 something years ago. What do you do? You just say, Josephine, you know, you're five years old, clean up your own mess. Already a step up and you, like you've done for the last couple decades, you clean up vomit and you wash cushions and you air out stuff. The call to action, you know, we, we, we fall in love with, especially since 9-11 here in the United States, we fall in love with the call to action of serving your country. And by God, it is. That's a big one. Uh, funny thing is I like it when people are all flag waving and saluting and everything and no member of their family has ever served. Whereas right now I have, um, I got two officers my, in my niece. I have a niece and nephew are both officers and, you know, everybody in my family served, two are disabled, many are dead, lost a cousin in Korea. I mean, it's easy to say to call to serve and, and, and talk about the military, but the call to serve is also your community and your neighbor and your children and your friends. I think when you're in a gym and you know what you're doing and someone's doing something stupid, you don't just take a, take your phone out and be take a video of them being dumb. No, you walk over and you help. That's a call to action right there. You know, you might make a difference in someone's life. Um, so yeah, there are multiple calls for action. And you ask this, how can one figure out which is his true call for action? The, the true call for action is understanding that the call is always being called. That trumpet to action is being blared right now. So and that's a tough lesson. And ideally, you know, I'm 62. I'd be very proud if a decade or two decades or five decades from now, people are still calling me up because um, they need a couch moved or they need puke cleaned up or they need a body to be buried. Okay. It's a good question, Ben Ben. All right. So Steve, <laughs> Steve, 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 Steve. God bless you, Steve. Now, Steve asks an interesting question, folks. It's one of those questions that comes back to me to the could we slash should we world, okay? So get ready for this one, okay? Here we go. Jurassic Park and Lost World, Michael Crichton's best work. Uh, how effective will Mass Made Simple be for the 50-plus crowd? 
Well, if you want to do it, I think there's great value. You do have to ask your question post 50. Uh, you got to ask the big question of, do I really want a, to do that many squats, which is a lot and B, do I really want to put on more mass? Cause we know after age 55, body mass becomes one of the bigger factors with longevity. Um, a, an older buddy of mine uh, went, put, on, put himself on Atkins years ago and he was, he was religious about, I mean, he was, he did, he did the two week induction for two years. I mean, he was keto before keto. And I said, why are you doing this? He goes, well, I went golfing with that 80 year old man. And the guy said to me, look around at all the old guys. I go, and I did. He goes, you notice something? I go, no. He goes, none of them are fat. None of them are big. And that's when he decided for longevity, being a bit leaner, a bit smaller might be a good idea. Could you do it? Absolutely. I think so. But I would do it as stated. And, uh, I mean, you might want to, you know, uh, glide back the, the squat numbers, but I would still do the complex. I would still probably do the bench press, make sure you have a good spotter. Um, and if you'd want to, if you know, if you weigh 200, maybe you want to take 185, 165 or 135 as your heavy load, whatever you choose, just, you know, to get back for the question about arthritis, because I don't want to be a cause of any pain, though. I don't know if squats cause, I don't know what causes arthritis. I don't think it was hundred percent sure. The other, the, so there's two things I'm trying to make you uh, think about Steve. First, the could question. Yeah, you could modifications. I may be going lighter in the squat, but don't do anything else. Should you? Well, that's up to you. But part of me is thinking mm, that's, that might be, that might be counterproductive to the goals of longevity. It might be great for other reasons. Like maybe you just want to, you know, look good on the beach. You know, um, I, I try to look good on the beach by wearing a red thong and huge gold chains. Um, cause, cause that's a joke folks. If you missed that. And the follow up question here is what about other programs? Well, I think the best thing you can do post 50 is, uh, is a, find a very simple program, a uh, park bench program. You do it several times a week, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry, go for a walk and, you know, of course, sleep hygiene, that is huge. Um, I mean, if you're asking me programs about one lift a day, I'd probably say no. If you're an Olympic lifter, that might be an interesting thing, though. The mobility work, flexibility work might not be there as much as you need. Big 21, probably not. Uh, it just depends. So that's going to be the big question all the time post 50, uh, Steve. The could we, should we questions. Okay. All right. Uh, folks, we have another question. One of my favorite authors, uh, this author tends to spend a lot of time on online being a big shot, uh, usually the smartest person in the room. This of course is Mr. Anonymous, Mr. Anonymous. I'm so glad to finally meet you. It's been so long. I recently fractured a bone in my right wrist while trying to put up hurricane shutters before hurricane Dorian. What are your thoughts on weight training, kettlebell training on the left side? while I'm waiting for the right side to heal. Sorry to answer this question already. Uh, it is an absolute, absolute game changer. When I blew my wrist apart in 2002 or so, uh, my doctor, Vanderhoof, was absolutely shocked how quickly I responded to uh, not only the surgery, but everything else. And he said, well, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm doing what you told me to do. Um, so I was doing these, these little rehab exercises. He would tell me to do it for 10 minutes a day. I would do it for hours a day. And then the other thing I squatted, I, I front squatted with my left arm straight ahead, my right arm in the rack. I front squatted. I did uh, heavy backpack carries, dragging a sled. And I did as much right arm um, uh, dumbbell work at the time as I could because I didn't have any kettlebells. So I had a 61-pound dumbbell that I did, everything I could think of. And I, within a year, I was not only healed, but I was back to where I was before the injury, which is very unusual in the kind of surgery I had. Okay. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, so the answer generally is yes, train. Um, uh, my college, my junior college coach, Coach Lahati, had an interesting thing. If you had a runny nose, you would, it was okay to work out. But if you had a fever, you shouldn't. 
And I've always thought that was a nice little rule of thumb. He had these little rules of thumbs about training or not. Uh, so for me, if you have an injury in any part of your body and you can train it all, train. Because you'll feel better. You will feel better because of the the hormones and I guess the serotonins and dopamines and all those other things that uh, spring from exercise. Um, if you read uh, Stu McGill's new book, The Gift of Injury, uh, if you have a back injury, which is the hardest, a lower spine, mid spine uh, cramps, injuries, back injuries in that area, I think those are the hardest to work around. But if you can just go for a walk, you don't want to if you have a back injury. If anyone here has ever hurt their back, you know. You, all you want to do with a back injury is just lay in bed and feel sorry for yourself. And even then that hurts because it cramps up. But if you can get yourself to walk, not long after you start walking, this that springing action of your steps and that movement will do miles for that back injury. So if you have a broken ankle of all the injuries you can have, that might be one of the easiest to train around. Uh, up to a knee, well, you start to lose certain movements. So you can't leg press, for example. You can't leg extend or leg curl. When you move up to a hip, you start to lose a lot of stuff fast. When you slide up to the spine, you really run it. You don't want to squat. You don't want to, you don't want to move up. You want to move down. Uh, when you move off into the shoulder, uh, it can be hazardous to, hazardous to work the other arm because of all the torque and tension on the shoulder. As you slide down to the elbow, all of a sudden you can do everything right-handed, all the leg work. And if you slide into your wrist, you can do pract like a, a, an injured ankle, you can do practically everything. I know that sounds weird. Oh, another rough one is the neck. An injured neck, oh, it is hard to work around an injured neck, but if you can just go for a walk or just bob and maybe even run in place in a swimming pool, you'll be a lot happier. We had a question uh, come up about preparing for the Russian kettlebell certification. It used to be called the Russian kettlebell challenge. There's a problem with the RKC weekend and it's the hundred swing, uh, I'm sorry, it's the hundred snatches. You have to snatch for gentlemen. It's usually, it's usually the 24 K bell a hundred times in a five minute period. And the problem is this thing destroys a lot of people's mental preparation uh, because they are so focused in on this event that they miss the fact that they're supposed to be there to be instructors with kettlebells. Um, so it's an interesting thing. And, um, and, and, and even as I say it out loud, I still get myself caught in the complexities of this. You know, I'm a moderate's moderate when it comes to most things. And so you know, there are people who think we should just throw the thing away. And I agree with them 100%. And there are people who say, no, we have to have some standard. And I agree with them 100%. But what happens is, is when you're training for, when you're training for the certification, is that your mind, your focus becomes getting this thing done. And people will drop out of the cert a week or two ahead of time because they tested at their home gym and, and didn't get the hundred and five minutes. So they say, forget it. I'm not going to come. And they miss the chance to learn kettlebells the right way. My record for helping somebody, uh, is, a uh, one I did in Ireland and the guy came in, he said, I all I could do was 78 and five minutes. And I gave him one or two little points about the snatch and he easily finished the test. He told me later on, I had the wrong mindset. I'm going, well, yeah, I know. Um, real simple. Let me summarize as best I can. Most people think you you count a snatch like this. Swing, lockout, swing. That's one. I think you're wrong. This is so funny. It, this is just not that. To me, this is like one of those things that once you understand what I'm saying, it's eye-opening. No. Instead, when you do 100 swings, the first one is swing to lockout. And that's the last time you count it like that. The swing is from the lockout you aggressively bring that bell down to your zipper so that you get this massive bow and arrow pre-stretch and then it snaps back up into the overhead press, uh, into the overhead, the way to walk, uh, the lockout position, okay? If you think that way, that you snatch from here down, the snatch goes top down versus bottom up. This guy told me, what is it? Is that 22 extra reps he got from just changing his mindset. So 
when I when uh, Brian puts this program up, the number one thing I want people to get across is the the snatch test just has to be another part of the certification. It can't be the bugaboo. It can't be the boogeyman. It can't be the Grendel. It can't be the monster under the stairs or under the bridge. And yet it is for most people. So one of the things I recommend is that you, and this is coming from a track coach, folks. If I tell you to run 400 meters, the first time you run 400 meters, it'll take you about 80 seconds with training. And we'll get that down to 70. Uh, as, you know, so you're a 14 year old, 13 year old, and you're in it in 70 or 69. Okay. Next year you go out for cross country or football, and then we show up early in the season. We get you in shape. And as a sophomore, we bring you down to 54, maybe 53. Next year, junior, we get you to 49. If you're in Utah, you're probably the state champion or right there. And if you take it serious as a senior, you get down to 47 seconds, would allow you to walk on to most major college universities in the United States. Not a scholarship, but a walk on. What you might have missed is this. 400 meters never changed. You might have, you know, you got older, more mature, developed. 400 meters another change. So when I coach the snatch test, it's 100 snatches. It's not 78. It's 100. So one of the first things I have you do is I'll take, uh, we'll take as light, uh, you know, you know, a normal person, a male, we might give them an eight kilo kettlebell and have them do the 100 snatches as, men, as you know, just go ahead, do 100 snatches. Well, that's pretty light. And then we assess one of three things. Is it your lungs? which is me. It's always my lungs. Is it your buns? Do you have a strong enough swing? Or is it your guns? Do you have a lockout? If it's your lungs, that's actually pretty easy if you give us time. Two, one or two days a week, we're going to have you do one, two, or three sets of 100 reps in the snatch with very light bells. To get used to, it's like running the 400 meters. You know, if you can only run 365 meters, no one cares because the race is 400. The race is to 100. If it's your buns, you're, you don't have a very good swing, and we have time, we might put you on the 10,000 swing challenge. Now, at the end of the 10,000 swing challenge, we'll test you again. You might just destroy that, that 100 reps. And if it's your guns, that's when we'll have you do waiter walks, you know, uh, maybe around well, my block is about 400 meters, uh, lots of clean and presses to really train that lockout and the strength to hold that lockout. Um, interesting, in my time with the people I tend to work with hands-on, lungs are always the issue, and that seems to come around the fastest. If it's buns, and that's usually not people who train here, um, generally something as simple as a 10,000 swing challenge cleans it up. And if it's guns, which you, almost universally is people that I either talk to on Skype or – um, you know, meet up with some in some corner of the United States for a little bit. They need to do lots, lots more presses. Um, I've also had people, um, I, I don't want to brag, but like me, who nailed the test the first time they tried it. Because this, you know, when you've been lifting as long as I have, it's kind of easy to, to do a test like that. I mean, not, no, I mean, I breathe hard, I sweat like a pig, the salt gets in my eyes. Uh, I make weird sounds. I, I probably swear a little bit when I'm done, but I can do it the first time. One of the things I'd warn someone like myself is that's great. You did the one test on the entire, uh, on an entire weekend. There's other things we need to work with you on. Uh, for me, I was not a very good hinger. Uh, being an Olympic lifter, I hinged, I, I hinged coming up. I never had really hinged coming down. That might make no sense to anybody, but Olympic lifters tend to hinge correctly to snap the weight overhead. We don't really hinge on the way down. So I'd never really thought about hinging down. Um, so for me, that was a glaring weakness. And there were some things uh, like in the Turkish getup where I really just wasn't knitted together. Uh, my point is important on this. One of the things, and I strongly recommend this, is to – Expose yourself once a year to something. It could be something as simple as a Spartan race or a race of any kind or a meet. Um, I've done in the last few years, I signed up for MoveNet, but then they canceled the event. 
Uh, I, I've done the fit rank certification and I've done a couple of other certs too, where I show up like a student, spend the two days learning things. And one of the reasons I like to do that so much is it exposes my weaknesses. And it could be something like mobility, which was exposed to me about a year ago. Uh, my understanding of some other things throughout the time. But what, what's nice about going to a cert is that it kind of rips that fabric away. You have another set of eyes or 15 sets of eyes on you. Um, the other day, someone was amazed when I talked about the fact that I have a, a personal trainer, um, Ben Fogel, and earlier than that, Buddy Walker. And I'm like, if, if you're a strength coach, you absolutely have to have a trainer because I'll always, I hate to say regress, fall back, regress to what I do best and never to what I do well. And oddly, what I do best sometimes technically is the worst stuff I do. I'm just a big engine and I can press all day. But that doesn't mean I press correctly. So one of the reasons you want to think about certifications, and the RKC is fine, fit ranks is great, move now. There's, there, there's, there's lots and lots of them, is to get yourself a little bit exposed, to have another set of eyes on you, and that will change the way you train others and even work with your own gym and friends. You know, folks, I, I have this Instagram account, Coach Dan John, and I will post something that I do in my workouts. And people will say things, well, why do you do that? And I'll say, well, that's because Ben Fogel told me to do that. Or that's because Brett Contreras told me to do that. And I'm always struggling because I will do these things, which I think are completely obvious to everybody in the world in my training. And yet, or easily, easy to look up. And yet people ask me on Instagram these questions. By the way, I'm not ripping on the questions. I'm just saying that I'm a big believer that you should have another set of eyes on you. And that's what I do. So my typical training week is very simple. Um, my wife's on the road. An important part of what I do is I try to go to bed as early as I can. Um, I'll watch mysteries and stuff like that. I've been watching a real uh, good series lately. Um, but I, I try to go to bed early. Last night I went to bed at eight. Uh, we had a massive storm. And the reason I try to go to bed so early is that I can wake up naturally in the morning. And if the research is correct, you should go to bed within two hours of sundown for your hormone health. Well, I've been doing that as much as I can for the last couple of months. And I got to tell you, folks, it is a game changer. When I wake up, I drink my coffee. I have coffee already made. Uh, and then I go on and I do my Columbia College work where I teach. I do as much as I can for the Dan John workout site because we're still trying to increase stuff. And I work for probably two or three hours at the computer, take care of my dog, drink coffee. And then every day at about nine o'clock, I rally up because it's time to work out. Um, I like to fast before I train whenever I, uh, even if I'm starving, it's better not to eat before I work out three days a week. I go to Epic fitness and I have a program, AB, AB, AB program, uh, fundamental human movements every single day at the workout. And I have, uh, I have a trainer, uh, a couple of them actually who, who alternate, but I always have a set of eyes on me. If I need a spotter, that's nice to have. Because I've been trying to go really heavy on some moves now that I feel better. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I'm at I'm at I'm at the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesdays, everybody comes to my house and we do the buns and guns workout. In fact, as I'm speaking, I just finished it. Uh, we did uh, real tough hip thrusts, followed by goblet squats, followed by Bulgarian goat bag swings, followed by clam shells for two rounds. And I got to tell you, it is an eye opening experience on round two. And then after that, we work the most important muscle in the body, the biceps and the triceps together, because one day a week, we all, and it, and it sounds good, buns and guns. Uh, Thursday is famously the tonic workout. Every Thursday, it's always the most crowded workout in my home gym here. Uh, we get 14 people. We do an hour of Tim Anderson's original strength uh, and with some vent work at the end. That's vents or wrist and uh uh, feet, uh, mobility exercises. Uh, sometimes we do the, the, the basic, uh, Aikido stretches too. It just kind of dep depends on time. Uh, by far that's the most popular workout. Oddly, and I can't even explain this. It's the workout people get the hungriest at somehow doing mobility work and feeling better makes you ravenous. After I work out is when I eat my first meal of the day. Um, 
I try to eat. My goal is eight vegetables a day. Uh, this morning for breakfast, I think I had 12. Uh, we went to the landmark and I had uh, chili and then a vegetable omelet. And I always try to count the num number of vegetables so I get all, you know, I'm supposed to do. So it's now oh, just about noon here and I've already and I've already finished all of my the to-do list that's on my daily pirate map and it's noon. So the rest of the day, uh, I uh, a couple days a week I go throw the javelin with my friend Nolan or my friend Ben and we throw the javelin for oh, oh for a while. Um and then after that, it's time for me to start winding down. I know it hasn't sound like much, but every every day I try to have some quality reading time. Rereading, I'll reread the same books. Uh, I like to watch mysteries. You know, if Tiff's on the road, that's that is how I spend uh, the early evening. Uh, and then dinner, very often, just very something very simple. Uh, again, protein, protein, veg vegetables. Um, I leave the weekends open for travel and social. Um, my social life is very important to me. Uh, Tuesday nights uh, we go to bingo. We meet up with some of our church friends. Both my daughters go with their uh, with their husbands. Um, uh, training partners go, and then we try to have at least one more kind of thing. It can be Thirsty Thursday, or Wednesday Champagne Night, or sometimes just a party on Friday nights or Saturday. But try to really have a quality social life. Um, my social life is very important to me. The more I travel, the more important it becomes. So that's that's typically how I shape my week. I wouldn't worry. Uh, gentle listener about the specifics of what I train because you really know it. Uh, if you go to the, what would, what would Dan John do the, the daily workout of the day? Uh, that's not exactly what I do, but it, I mean, it's close enough. Uh, it, it's funny when I look at the workout, sometimes it's like, yeah, that's, that's really, a, that's a much better workout than the idiotic thing I did. So, uh, there's no shocks. There's no surprises. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 62. I'm still, I'm st I can still press the beast with both hands. I can still Olympic lift. I turned the caber, you know, what, two months ago, I turned the caber again. Um, and the answer to all this really isn't, it's, it's not, you know, it's not taking a sledgehammer and beating myself in the face. You know, it's that daily gentle nudge of eating vegetables every day, drinking lots of water every day. Um, not only getting my workouts in, but having some fun with Ben and the gang throwing the javelin. It's not just reading in my field, but, you know, like reading Dune again or The Count of Monte Cristo or uh, Beaugest or something like some fun adventure book that I read as a eight-year-old that still makes me happy. It's, it's those little tiny steps that you do every day. That adds up much bigger than trying to cram everything into four or six weeks. Um you know, it's like I was telling my daughter is uh, in, in a situation where her, her money just got much better. And, and I sat her down and reminded her, you know, three, you have to have three buckets. The first one is uh, the emergency fund, which is about 1500 bucks. That's easy. That's about the, whatever the uh, hot water heater costs is how much money you need. A uh, hot water heater co costs about the same as four new tires. It's, you know, or, or, uh, or a transmission repair. They're all about the same amount, 1500 bucks. Once you have that 1500 bucks, then the second bucket is to eliminate debt. After you basically eliminate debt, you should have a third bucket for that dream that you have. And the funny thing is, it's okay to fill up all three buckets, but it's most important to take care of bucket number one first, and then get rid of debt, and then that fortune fund, that dream, whatever that thing is down there. But always fill that up a little bit. How complicated was what I just said, the three bucket theory of personal finance. Well, it's really, really simple. And you can't just take your paycheck one day and say, I'm going to pay off all my debt with this because little things like food and gasoline and water and bills aren't going to allow you to do that. I see finance and fitness and friendship and food with all the exact same set of lessons. Um, and so when you look at the way I train or I try to assemble my life, um, it's my idea is to just basically keep adding the, the bricks every day to that pyramid. I don't think you should try to one, 
give me those 1 million bricks. I'm going to make a pyramid today. I don't think that's a good way to look at a life. I'd much rather see you build brick upon brick upon brick consistently over time and build that nice big foundation and then build that pyramid to the sky. Well, folks, it's time to say goodbye. Now, remember, if you have questions, contact us at podcast at danjohnworkouts.com. Um, ideally, we'll have more questions than this every week, but thank you for following us. And until next time, never let go. <laughs>